Hello, welcome everyone to the California Wine Institute's Behind the Wines with our host, Elaine Chacon Brown. Thank you all for taking the time out to be with us today. So this month, California Wine Institute's Behind the Wine series brings a regional focus to our continued exploration of the development of the Golden State's wine industry and its place on the world stage. Our host, Elaine, will speak with leading authorities in wine media, education, hospitality, and science to weigh in on the state of California wine and offer insights about general perceptions on the subject in their respective communities. These conversations will highlight the exchanges between California and other great wine regions of the world, the common threads as well as the varied approaches to viticulture and winemaking. Today, we have the great pleasure to welcome Wink Lorsch, who joins us from her current residence in France. Before we get started, some housekeeping reminders for everyone. During the webinar, note that there are two communication methods available to participants, a chat section and a Q&A section. The chat section is an informal way for you to communicate with other participants. Just be sure to select everyone in the to field as it can default to panelists only. And the Q&A section is where we would like you to submit your questions to be answered during the webinar. We will do our best to address your questions. And for those that are not answered live, we will provide a Q&A summary in the email you'll receive following the program. Now I'd like to introduce our host, Elaine. In addition to writing for her own site, Waka Waka Wine Reviews, she serves as the American specialist for JancisRobinson.com and contributes to a long list of respected publications. She contributed to the eighth edition of the World Atlas of Wine, which has won multiple awards very recently, as well as the award-winning fourth edition of the Oxford Companion to Wine. She was named by the International Wine and Spirits Competition and Vanitaly as one of the world's top wine communicators of the year for the last two years in a row. And Wink, a wine educator, wine Wink taught at the diploma level for the WSET for many years on subjects from the Loire through non-traditional method sparkling wines and wines of the Americas. Wink is a long-term member of the Circle of Wine Writers and has contributed to books by Jancis Robinson Master of Wine, Tom Stevenson, and Oz Clark, and written for numerous magazines. Living between London and the French Alps over the past 15 years, she has become the English language specialist of the wines of Jura and Savoie. She has self-published two books, Jura Wine in 2014, and Wines of the French Alps, Savoie, Bougie, and Beyond in 2019, which recently won the OIV Award for the Wines and Territories category. So congratulations, Wink. Now, Elaine, I'll turn it over to you. Hey, Wink. Great to see you, Elaine. Nice, good we to see were, you. We were having lunch only a year ago. A in year ago. Exactly. Yeah, yeah, I know. I was thinking about that this morning. I want to congratulate you again, though. You're, you know, both of your books um, were self-published, and they both won significant wine book awards, and and it's it's always an accomplishment to win an award for one of your books but to to accomplish that with books you also put all of the effort in yourself it's really quite significant so congratulations again wow thank you thank you yeah. very much it's very gratifying well and the oiv award you actually just found out this weekend yeah i did it was yeah. like the end of friday and they they don't do a short list like um other awards so although i knew that at some point i'd sent off books enough books for the judges suddenly like five o'clock on friday afternoon i get this you have won little thing and and the other weird thing is that they choose categories for you so you don't really know what you're doing when you send it because um most of their categories are very technical and they they tend to favor very technical books but this is i guess the loosest category and so uh yeah it was great great to have that and and should help sales a bit to people who read english in in france especially that's great that's great well so today we're talking about um subjects that connect to both of your books so wines from jura and wines from the french alps mainly savoie and um you know i i moved to um, this part of California in 2012. And I, I honestly, you know, it's a little bit of a joke, but on actually honestly happened. So when I moved here, I, people were very kind and in, in inviting me to dinner and things. 
And after a few months, I stopped accepting dinner invitations because it was guaranteed that what would be served was wines of the Jura with chicken. And th so there were, <laughs> there were two things. It was like, no one could imagine what to pair with wines from the Jura except chicken. But also, even though I was in Napa, Sonoma, everybody I was interacting with was drinking wines from Jura. And I feel like the, you know, it was on the wine, the interest in wines from Jura was on this great rise at the time. And that I feel like it's kind of held. It's not huge, you know, mass uh, cultural popularity, but kind of devoted wine geek, wine lovers. Wines of the Jura has a really passionate following. And I wonder if you could comment on, you know, what is that? Why, why are these varieties uh, of so much excitement to people? Trousseau is one of the obvious ones to name there. Um, but just the Jura in general, people all over the world, passionate wine geeks, really love wines from the Jura. So what's, what's behind that? Well, first of all, to be completely honest, uh, I didn't understand why at the beginning. Um, I was just discovering them and writing about them because I was commissioned to do so just to fill, well, not, to, for completeness sake in the French sections of encyclopedias and things like that. And uh, I, I didn't, I just thought of the whole thing as being really bizarre. And Vin Jaune was very, very famous. Um, I, the red wines, really freaked me out when I first discovered them, which is, is now um, nearly 20 years ago. And I really had a hard time with them. And gradually I got to know them and I got to, as you always do, love the people, uh, find the grapes intriguing, which the indigenous ones, the Sauvignon, the white Sauvignon, the reds, Trousseau and Pulsar, um, and then initially I refused to taste the Chardonnay because, hey, you've got Chardonnay everywhere. And then I realized that that was being very, very rude to the producers. <laughs> I very quickly realized that because it was and still is the most planted variety. And suddenly I discovered there were these really exciting Chardonnays from, from Jura. So I was sort of developing this thing without realizing that, actually there were importers bringing them into the US because at the time there weren't importers bringing them into the UK apart from the occasional Van Jean for a real specialist market. And I actually went to, in 2008, I attended the Napa Wine Writers Conference mm -hmm. and I was chatting to a couple of people about what I did and blah, blah, blah. And then I said I had this obscure thing that I wrote for Tom Stevenson on Jura and Savoir, and uh, two people went, you know about the Jura? And I sort of looked at them and I went, yeah, I, I, know, I know quite a lot about the Jura, actually, yeah. I go there every year. And, and they were so excited and they said they didn't get enough wines and all the rest. And that's when I started sort of writing more for and, and got a, a break to write for an American publication about Jura. So I then had to analyze what it was that was making Americans in particular, but later I discovered this were people from, uh, it, it, it sort of snowballed and it became Scandinavians, uh, Japanese, Australians. and later the English too, that were all sort of desperate and hungry for knowledge. And so why is it? Well, it, it ticks, ticks a lot of boxes. It did then in particular, and it still does. But, but then it became exciting because this was really something that wine geeks and wine professionals who were looking for something different could hang on to as, as somewhere authentic with a handful of unusual grape varieties with some really weird styles. And it was a little bit like, because people didn't understand it, then that made it even the more intriguing. And then there was this other factor that was so odd. Um, I discovered that New York, who were ahead of the game a little bit with San Francisco, were particularly enamored with Pulsar, also called Plusar. And it was beginning to be served by the glass um, 10, or 10 years ago or so in wine bars. And I was sort of, 
perplexed by this because I personally couldn't get my head around Pulsar, Trousseau, yes, but not so much Pulsar. And then I suddenly realized why it was happening. And I think even though nobody really verbalized it, I'm probably the only one to have actually spoken out about this. I think it was an anti-Parker wine reaction that really not just Pulsar, but really all of the wines, the many, many wine styles from the Jura are diametrically opposed to the wines being recommended by the wine advocate and by Parker and all the rest. And people were hungry for that. And so that, that's yeah. my take on it. Well, there's, I, I know something you and I have spoken about um, too, is that there's a way in which just the local culture of these parts of France, you know, so uh, far Eastern, a little bit South France, they're less inclined to, to welcome outside visitors. There's not a lot of enotourism. You know, there's a little bit of reticence from them about the fact that other parts of the world are growing their varieties. Even though they have Chardonnay, the Chardonnay, there's, there's nothing international or, or kind of standard about the Chardonnay from Jura. It's, they're very different styles of wine. And so, you know, in a lot of ways, Jura is, is the poster kid for, for uniqueness and, and unusual wines and a little bit of obscurity and really kind of holding on to its own identity. And I think the last 10 years, the world of wine has been seeking a notion of authenticity and trying to figure out what that means. And, and the thing is, the Jura did not get swayed to change its winemaking styles by big international movements that Parker came to represent. Um, it certainly hasn't been swayed by outsiders. Um, I'm sure there are always exceptions to that with a couple of producers and a few cuvées and, and some, some of them have learned good, good things from outsiders and some of them have learned less good things from outsiders. Mm -hmm. But the reality is, is um, Jura is a minuscule region. Um, this is the, the smallest region as a, as a sort of an individual region in the whole of France. It's smaller than Savoie. Um, and I, I wrote, I wrote something. I, I, I looked this up. So, because, you know, I forget what I think about these things. I just, it, it, it is fascinating that this tiny, the tiniest wine region of France can be so different and so intriguing to all the other regions that we know well, that we know well in France and even anywhere else. Um, but there is another factor that I, I haven't mentioned and, and you haven't either. And that is that um, it's the organic side. Um, mm -hmm. Jura was not ahead of the game in, in organics, but right up there. And for a tiny region, almost close to the rest of the world, and with quite a difficult climate and difficult heavy soils as well, which means that weeds grow like fury and uh, the classic sort of um, mildews and rots and disease uh, are, uh, can rage rampant there. For them to actually grab hold of organics as something they really wanted to do mm -hmm. and, and to become... Uh, what they are today, which is about 17, 18% of plantings are organic, which compares to 10 or 12% in the whole of France right. and less in many other areas. It's pretty impressive. And I think that intrigued, uh, interested, um, interested uh, specific importers. And so you, you, that was another box that they could tick, really. Yeah. Well, let's go ahead and look at a map. Um, let's look at the big map of France, Katie, and that way we can really ground the conversation in where in the world we're talking about. And then we'll also start bringing it into connection with California. But the, um, <clears throat> because part of understanding where we're talking about is also knowing what it's in proximity to. And so if we look at this map, um, and we'll look at a closer map in a second as well, but Katie, if you could highlight Jura there. <clears throat> Notice it's um, essentially on the border, very close to the border with Switzerland, very far, you know, all, almost all the way east in France, kind of central in the north-south sense. But look at how profoundly close it is to Burgundy. 
And then just below uh, Jura, again, still close to the border of Switzerland, but a different part of it, you see the Savoie there in the French Alps. And notice um, Lyon is kind of the northern point of the Rhone. And so there you end up with a region relatively close to the Rhone. And if we could um, zoom into Wink's map from her book on the Jura, Katie, if you could again highlight where the Jura is. So this orange area is the Jura. And you'll notice that it is only an hour east drive from Bonn, which of course is in the heart of Burgundy. And then um, towards the south, the kind of purpley pink color, the darker of, of the two there, that kind of dotted around area is all Savoie. And you'll notice again Lyon there in the kind of lower left corner, which is again the northernmost point of the Rhone. So part of the point to make here that, that you so nicely put yesterday when we were speaking is um, the Jura is relatively close to Burgundy and the, the, some of the key wine grapes that we're going to talk about are more closely related to Pinot. And then similarly, the Savoie is more closely um, in proximity to the Rhone and actually uh, Mandas, which we'll talk about in a little bit, is also more closely related to Syrah. So there's actually kind of a family of grapes that we can talk about in each case. But what, what we're going to actually do, if we could pull up the the first map of California as well. One of the things that's interesting here and that I think a lot of people don't realize because it's sort of emerging. So again, there's been a growing interest around the world in the wines of Jura especially, but there's actually been, these varieties um, have been in California for quite a long time. Some of them since what was essentially the founding of California wine, um, both Trousseau and Mondo's have been here since the, um, 1880s actually. And what, we're, what we've seen now is that these different varieties from the Jura and the French Alps are actually getting planted all over the state of California. And this first wine that we want to talk about, um, Katie, if you could highlight Trinity Lakes up there in the north. I'm so excited to be able to talk about Iroi and Method Sauvage because a lot of people don't even realize this wine is from a vineyard planted all the way up next to Mount Shasta. And a lot of people, you know, traditionally we tend to say, oh, Mendocino is the furthest north that people have vineyards. But in actuality, there's a little constellation of vineyards up all the way north in California, near Mount Shasta to the west of Redding. And this first wine, the Sauvignon, is actually um, from that area. And so if we could go ahead and start talking about that first wine. My part of my job, of course, is also to manage time. Um, so the truth is, a lot of people um, are not going to know what Sauvignon is. If you do, a, if you try to do research about Sauvignon online, you end up with a lot of misspellings of Sauvignon Blanc. But let's make the first clear point: Sauvignon is its own variety, and in fact, it's what um, uh, we've more recently discovered. It's actually what we could call a founder variety. Would you like to? explain what that means? Yeah, um, the term founder variety, founder grape variety, um, was coined by the ampelographer or grape scientist, grape biologist, um, the Swiss uh, Jose Wiemos. And Jose was a co-writer with Jancis Robinson and, and Julia Harding of the, the magic, magical tome, mm -hmm. uh, Wine Grapes. And uh, I think they kept this really very, very secret until it launched. And when it launched, uh, I can't remember, about 2012, I think, um, it, it, they pinpointed a dozen or so varieties that they called founder varieties. And I was extremely excited to find that Sauvignon, at the time I was doing so much work on um, Jura that, that Sauvignon was a founder of variety and in fact so was Mondeuse Noir um, or Red Mondeuse from Savoie and they were both founder varieties so I have been trying to get my head around what that really means and it was something that that Jose used as a tool to describe varieties that were among the earliest he could find in Western Europe that had actually in their family tree they were the top of the family tree 
they gave birth to so many other um, children in a great varieties. So in the in the Sauvignon family, you've got Chenin Blanc, um, you've got Trousseau, in fact, um, you've got various Spanish varieties, you've got all sorts of things that are in that family. And uh, he makes the point today, because I, I emailed him uh, just in the last day about this, and he said that today, of course, that you would add a load more that came from Greece or Georgia or, or those sort of areas that are cradle of wine. But Sauvignon, if I can just speak to Sauvignon for a while, um, it is a key variety. It's the, the key variety, white, interesting white variety from the Jura. There are only two varieties, white, main white varieties in the Jura, Chardonnay and Sauvignon. And Sauvignon is the only one that's allowed to be used for Vin Jaune, but it is also, uh, so that is the, the extreme oxidative style of Sauvignon. But in the last 20 years, the producers have started making um, topped up white wines, in other words, made in the way that the rest of the world has always, or in recent, in modern times, made white wines. So in a, a away from oxygen and topping up the barrels or the tanks or whatever to keep that oxygen away. So most producers now in Jura make a, a topped up Sauvignon. But in the Jura, they always talked about Sauvignon as being related to Tramana. And when I say Tramana, I mean specifically Tramana rather than Gewurz Tramana. Right. But it was Jose, who is a very, very good educator about, um, about grapes, and he and, and their history and, and their family trees and so on. And he explained to me that it was absolutely incorrect to say that uh, Sauvignon was a cousin or uh, related to Tramina, because genetically speaking, it is Tramina. They're mm -hmm. absolutely identical. And Gewurz Tramina is um, a variation. It's what they call an aromatic variation of Tramina or Sauvignon. So the big question, of course, is did it come from the Jura originally? Or did it come from sort of southern Germany, northern, northeast Italy, where you would find Tramina? And uh, as the pun goes, the jury is out. Um, but it's almost certainly, they have a growing amount of evidence that it is from Jura originally. So it's, it's, it's almost certain. Um, well, so, and then here in California, um, we actually don't know for sure when Sauvignon arrived. Part of it is because there is this, these multiple names, as you're pointing out. And then a, a lot of times here in the U.S. and specifically in California, if someone hears the word Traminer, they assume we mean Gewurztraminer, when actually they are two separate varieties. And, and in fact, there are a couple of producers that bottle Traminer or Traminer here in California. And it's unclear wh what they... What, cut, what cuttings they actually have. But part of why speaking about Sauvignon in the California context is relevant right now is because it's actually getting proliferated across the state. This is all very, you know, kind of small test plantings, but there's actually some going in um, to vineyards in the Sierra foothills. There's some that's been planted in Cambria, which is the coastal part of the central coast west of Paso Robles. Um, this is, um, of course, Sauvignon that's been planted at high elevation in very northern California um, up to the west of Mount Shasta. And, and there are people that have plans to put it in parts of the Russian River as well. And so this, as far as I know, though, the Iroi is the first is um, the first wine bottled as Sauvignon. And um, he actually, though, received his cuttings from McCallamy Glen Vineyard in Lodi. And, and there's an interesting, Bob Koff is, um, he's a wonderful character in Lodi. He, um, he drives around his vineyard on a tractor style lawnmower to make it easier. Mm -hmm. But he, um, he, his family originates from Germany and, and as part of his celebration of his heritage, he gathered, um, around a hundred different varieties. He has the largest collection of German varieties in North America, all planted in sort of a catalog like fashion. You can walk the rows and every few, every few vines, there's another little wooden sign naming which one is there. Mm -hmm. And so these um, 
traminer cuttings came from the Kauf, uh, McGalmy, Glen Vineyard, and Lodi, and were established there in near Mount Shasta, but now um, known as Savignon. And, you know, just to take a quick minute, one of the things that you were pointing out, though, is uh, Josea has talked about genetically these are identical, but you and I have talked about how actually Savignon from the Jura versus Traminer from Germany, even though they're genetically identical, what we know about vines is they do adapt and some of the characteristics shift. And I know Chad and, and you both have talked about, Chad being the winemaker for Uruguay, um, have talked about how you believe that that is relevant to this particular wine. Yeah, well, I, I tasted, um, I did actually, this is the 2019, but I had the 18 very late at night in California a year, a year ago. And I remember enjoying it and desperately wanting it to be like a Sauvignon Wille, which is the, the, the word for a topped up Sauvignon um, from the Jura. And I wasn't sure about it, but it was late at night. And now it's not late at night and I'm a little bit more focused and I've got the 2019. And the nose is really quite aromatic, um, but not aromatic, not as anywhere near as extreme yeah. as a Gewurztramina would be. Yeah. There's no way it's Gewurztramina, um, but it, it doesn't have the lemony character that I, I associate with topped up Jura Sauvignon. Well, I mean, just tasting the wine, my, it occurs to me that it has a little bit of oxidative influence. It's got just that edge of almond skin nuttiness, just a hint. But like one of the things we should clarify just briefly too is that Vin Joan is a particular style of wine from the Jura that is very, is very oxidative, extended aging, uh, white, made from Sauvignon. And, and so this wine is a, has been made not in a Vinjon style, but I would say it's not just a clean, straight to press, topped up white, as you've been calling it either. It feels like it has just a touch of, just a touch of that oxidative influence, but in, in a really delicious, pleasing sort of way. I'm going to completely disagree with you. Okay. Sorry, Elaine. <laughs> no, okay. I just, I can't buy that. Um, yes, there's some old oak influence. Yes, definitely. And I know he uses a bit of old oak, but um, this is far removed from anything oh, potentially yeah. oxidative um, in, in the Jura. And yeah. it is, I, what I do find interesting about it, that it has in common with the Jura is the structure of the wine, never mind the flavors, but that steely, dry, vibrant acidity that is um, presumably coming partly from the northerly situation and the fact that it, it's um, pretty high altitude. I think that it, he said 2,400 feet which for those of us in meters is a little bit over 700 meters. And that compares with um, most Jura vineyards are between uh, 300 and 400 meters. So if you like half as high, mm -hmm. on the other hand, the latitude is different because in the Jura you're at about 46 degrees latitude. And even in that part of Northern California, you would be what, 37 or something? 30, yeah, maybe? I was going to say 38, but yeah, something about okay, that. Okay, yeah, around there. So that makes a difference, but was still, but, but it also means that they're, they're related in a while. And I'm, I'm wondering whether it is the combination of the fact that this grape does give vibrant acidity and that steely dry character. Um, and 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 the, in when it's grown in the right place, but Sauvignon is known in the Jura to like clay, and right. I there's no clay here at all, and I just sort of wonder whether the whole combination of all of this, the fact that it came from originally German rootstock, and the fact that it's not on the same soil and we're just somewhere completely different yeah but i can i do believe it's the texture and the structure that you can have in common and i also i'm very very excited that there's more plantings going yeah. in 
I think it's white varieties that are so overlooked at the moment in terms of rare and unusual varieties. Uh, the focus is all on red. And I was so keen that we should have a white in this session as well. Um, so, yeah. Well, and I want to I want to make a point of really thanking these three producers because mm -hmm. they went to very great effort in the middle of harvest to ship their wine to you in France. And, and that's really quite significant. And I, you know, I actually, so just to clarify, I don't mean that this is anything like Vinjon. I just mean that it's, it's a bit of a, it's not as far um, over as just straight depressed stainless steel, very crisp white, which I think we would tend to assume uh, a white that's not oxidative would be more like very steely, very clean. It does have that really bright crisp acidity that you're talking about. And that's part of what excites me about knowing that more Sauvignon is going into California. I think one of the best things California does is high acid whites. But like you mm -hmm. said with Jura, the, these high acid whites don't get as much attention. People are still more focused on reds. But I think that this one wine that we get to talk about here, it's a really exciting example of, of how California has so much potential. It, th the fact that it's growing in an area people rarely talk about there being vineyards is another example of potential. Mm -hmm. And I know Chad, um, who again, owns and makes Iroi and Method Sauvage, he was very excited to be able to show this wine to us because it is an alpine environment. And so he felt like there's at least some comparison, but let's keep moving. We want to manage time a little bit. And now the second wine we have, of course, we're talking about Trousseau, which as we just said, is also from the Jura. It is, it is related to the variety Sauvignon. And this second wine um, from Jolie Lade, it does have just a touch of uh, Poulsard and it has, um, also just a tiny, tiny touch of Gamay and Val de Guy as well, but um, altogether those other free varieties are less than 2% of, um, of the total. And so this is essentially a Trousseau Noir. One of the things that we need to clarify for our, our American audience though, is there's some confusion about Trousseau Noir versus Trousseau Gris. They're very different varieties. And if you could just clarify uh, what the difference is and why are we not talking about Trousseau Gris? Oh, um, you're really putting me on the stop there. I know nothing about Trousseau Gris because Trousseau Gris is, I know, grown in California, but it isn't simply not grown in the Jura at all. And uh, it is a separate variety. I, I am, I'm pretty sure they're the same family, but I didn't look it up before this session. Well, so and that's actually as much, like just your answer there already makes my point, which is that... Yeah. Um, I think a lot of people, because they have the same first name, assume they're intimately related, but the point is, is already made. Trousseau Noir is one of the really important varieties of the Jura. Trousseau Gris is just a different variety, and Ca California is one of the places that has and celebrates it, but it doesn't really show up anywhere else. It's, um, it's not a driving force in, in France or in Europe. And so, so I just wanted to make sure we clarify, we're talking about Trousseau Noir yeah. and, and um, Trousseau Gris, while that makes interesting wines, is not related in, in, to this conversation in that sense. But the, um, you know, one of the things to know about Trousseau, though, too, is it's been, um, it's actually been in California at least since the 1880s. Uh, we have, if you look at old uh, grape harvest reports from 1885, we actually see them carefully tracking cuttings from um, of Trousseau, which they specify comes from Monterey in Spain of Galicia, and then also um, side by side with cuttings from Bastardo just across the border in Portugal, that actually um, they were very carefully trying to sort out which, even though they're, they're genetically identical, they were trying to figure out, oh, mm -hmm. do the cuttings from Spain versus the cuttings from Portugal grow better here? And so we know that we've had it all the way um, back to the 1800s, but it went through, um, kind of a mini resurgence here. Arnott Roberts released uh, Trousseau um, uh, around 10 years ago. And, and now there's Trousseau not only in Lake County, it was kind of reestablished because of the por interest in port wines that were happening, mm -hmm. the possibility of making fortified port style wines here in California in the 90s. But now it's actually, again, it's spreading across um, the West Coast, not only California, but it's planted in Lake County, multiple parts of the Sierra foothills, Russian River Valley, the far coastal mountains of Sonoma, 
down in Santa Barbara County in Paso Robles. It's really spread all over the state. And in a lot of ways, Trousseau stands as kind of the driving force for interest in this style of wine in, in a new world context, but especially um, here in California. Mm -hmm. Well, I can talk a little bit about Trousseau. Yes, please. Uh, in the Jura and compared to Bastado and so on from Portugal and, and, and why I think this has happened. And in the, in the Jura, although there is much less Trousseau grown than there is Pulsar, um, it is widely considered to be the, the best red variety for, for quality wines. Um, although reds have always been considered secondary in the Jura, well, I say always, they have been in recent, in modern times, whereas hundreds of years ago, when they would have just blended all the reds together and there'd have been lots and lots of other reds, um, they, were, they were very prized from the Arbois area and even went to the French court. So today, Trousseau is the sort of standard bearer for, for um, fine and, and arguably more approachable red than a Pulsar red is, for example. Mm -hmm. But typically the Trousseau in Jura, the vast majority of, of vignerons, of producers don't actually age it in oak. Um, that has been, uh, although I know that the ones coming to the US from the Jura tend to be aged in oak, but it's always old oak. Sometimes it's large oak, large, and I mean, great big foudre, as they're called. Um, these days, more and more, they, they're using Dimi Mui, which are five or 600 liter double, double barrels, if you like. Um, and uh, they have usually destemmed Trousseau, whereas uh, in California, I believe most producers are using whole bunch. Now, there's a very good reason for the difference, I would say, and that is that the fear in Jura is not having ripe stems. And that's right. what happens yeah. in a cool climate. And if you don't have ripe stems, then you might get extra bitterness. Mm -hmm. So a lot of it is hand destemmed in a very old fashioned way. Um, I'm not saying that everyone destems, but the vast majority do. Uh, and then they will leave the wine on the skins for some time, the good producers, a couple of weeks um, uh, before pressing. And uh, I, I love the fact that here that in California, of course, uh, there's so much foot, foot mm -hmm. treading going on, foot pressing, which you see very rarely in the Jura, except with tiny, tiny, tiny natural wine producers. So arguably things are more technical in the Jura than they are in California at the moment, well, which well, is I, weird. I love you making that point because I think a lot of times people assume these more obscure parts of France um, are far more natural and far, you know, far more kind of ancient technique oriented. But actually, it, it's often times that really the New World regions that are most obsessed with these very hands-on, put-yourself-in-the-tank sort of practices like foot treading. Yes, but there's a but here, and the but I get in tasting this wine, and I got it earlier on, and that is the concept of old oak in Jura, or the concept of using oak in Jura versus the concept of using what is called old, old oak in California is, is completely different. Because to me, this wine, although it is not oaky, the oak has given it a creamy character. And I don't believe, I, I'm sure that um, uh, the guys at Jolly Lay would argue with me because I've had arguments with other wines like this, but I'm so used to Jura wines that I would never taste that creaminess in a Jura, Jura wine. And I'm still get, I'm getting a similar fruit and I'm getting a, a lovely lightness and a freshness to this that I would also find in Jura. But there is that other side of it. And I, I would love to see some California Trousseau producers shun oak completely. And, and just not use any oak when they make their, their trousseau. 
and just bottle it straight from perhaps a concrete tank, perhaps a metal tank, perhaps something that isn't stainless steel, which I understand is very reductive, whereas the whole reason for them using the oak is to give this some air and to give it some softness and so on, which is um, done in, in uh, Jura as well. But so many Jura trousseaux are bottled really, really fast, uh, very, mm -hmm. very early, straight from tank. And the tanks, the tanks might be stainless steel, they might be anything else. And sure, they'll do a lot of um, oxidative movement, if you like, just to, to stop this being such a, a stinky, stinky wine, which well, it, and, it potentially can be. Well, and I think, I mean, some of the difference in growing conditions are emerging in this conversation too, you know, so mm -hmm. California has a little more sunlight, so they're able to do whole cluster, but whole cluster, of course, increase it increases the natural tannin load in the wine. And then, so then suddenly you need to start thinking about how do I soften the wine, but also Trousseau Noir tends to go reductive or get a little bit um, tight and stinky in its fermentation. And so you want to avoid tight closed vessels like stainless steel. So the combination of elements ends up saying, pushing us into aging in a, in a aerative vessel. I think though your point about concrete, that that would, um, that also allows some air flow, yeah. you know, Trousseau is also like, um, this is a variety though, that, like I said, it's actually increasing all over the state of California. There's a quite a big planting of it. That's gone into Mendocino, um, Santa Barbara County, um, big parts of the central coast, Sierra foothills, you know, but it's also gone into Oregon and Southern Washington as well. It's really spread through yeah. the West coast. No, I've, I've had the chance to try some Oregon um, versions too. And I think it's, uh, it, it, of all the Jura and Alpine grape varieties that I know of that are being planted or even planned to be planted in California, Trousseau makes the most sense because Trousseau is, is, has got to be, the reason that it's in small quantities in Jura is it needs to be very site specific. It has to have the absolute warmest slopes, the ones mm -hmm. that are south facing, the ones that are on warmer soils with some gravels, not just clay, which is cold. And, and so warmer, warmer soils, steeper slopes, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And so it's limited in the Jura. And when you realize that it thrives in Portugal and to a lesser extent, Spain, it, it sort of begins to make sense yeah. uh, why Trousseau, and forgive me, I'm just calling it like the French do Trousseau, um, because of what you said earlier on. We they and and be warned if you travel to the Jura and you start talking about Trousseau Noir, they won't know what you're talking about. Well, and so, here I'm just making a point of clarifying because again, uh, you're in the right. California yeah. context, people get confused with Trousseau Gris. Um, mm. But this is, I mean, it's an example of this is a very unique part of the world where that confusion could occur. Anywhere else, yeah. you would only mean um, dark Trousseau or Trousseau Noir. But let's go ahead and look at the third wine. Um, I, you know, and before, before we start talking about it, I'd like you to go ahead and, and let us all know the proper pronunciation of this third grape variety that we're about to talk about. Well, as Elaine knows, this was my mission a year ago. I spent You're five weeks California. traveling in the US. And um, in theory, I was there promoting my, my latest book. But in practice, I was there to teach people how to pronounce Mondeurs. And it is Mondeurs. And I can only just think of the state of Jersey. And if you think of the er uh in Jersey, it's Mondeurs. Um, but but just for goodness sake don't say it with a real jersey accent <laughs> which i can't do but anyway it is mondeurs that's just the french uh, for those of you that that know a little bit of french it's like the female for happy je, je suis heureuse because i'm drinking mondeurs so i am happy because i'm drinking mondeurs um and it's great to have a chance to talk about savoir and the french alps which have way, way, way more great varieties um, than uh, Jura does. So this, I was, uh, and, and Mondeurs is such an exciting variety. Um, it's another founder variety. 
it uh, and yet it was thanks to research by um, the wonderful Carol Meredith, mm -hmm. Professor Carol Meredith and her team, um, now retired professor um, with running Lavier Meredith with her husband Steve. Um, it was thanks to her that we really understood the genetics and the family history of Mondeuse, but more specifically of Syrah. So Carol and her team discovered that the uh, one of the parents of Syrah was a separate variety, um, a little bit like we've just been talking about, which is Mondeuse Blanche. And Mondeuse Blanche is an entirely separate variety, genetically speaking, to Mondeuse Noir. And uh, Mondeuse Blanche is a parent of Syrah, along with Durif. Um, and so it didn't take them long to figure out that Mondeuse Noir was in the same family. But in fact, they have a gap in the family tree. So they're not absolutely sure where it fits in. And either it's a, a half sibling of, of Syrah or it's a grandchild of Syrah. So, or a grandparent, I can't remember which it is because I always get them confused myself. But there's no question that it's in the Syrah family. On the other hand, it behaves entirely differently in the French Alps than, than Syrah does. Syrah, well, I say it in, it, it's um, different in that it copes with the cool climate. And I mean, a very cool climate compared to the Northern Rhone. And typically in Savoie, uh, Mondeuse, grapes will never ripen to a potential alcohol that's more than about 10 percent so traditionally it's been chaptalized or enriched in other words they've added sugar to the juice and it's literally only been due to climate change and the extraordinarily hot summers that um, this part of france has had in the last couple of years that more and more producers are able to produce to make to have a nat natural sugars of 11 or 12 percent. Um, so the first Mondeurs that I ever tried in its pure state, I think was the one from Lagier Meredith, but I may have had the one from Aubon Climat at one point, which was the first one to be planted, I believe, if uh, in modern times. Well, so this is very interesting. So the, um... We're actually unsure of when we got actual mondas in here in California because the um, federal labeling law uh, here in the United States actually uh, treats uh, mondas and rafosco as synonyms. Yeah. And the reason for that is um, they actually used to believe they were the same variety. And, um, and so the law, like labeling laws were passed to allow um, Rafosco to be labeled as Mondas or vice versa. And then it's only been uh, recently through genetic testing and the work of people like Carol Meredith that we've realized they're separate varieties. But we actually, we know we've had Rafosco back again to the 1880s. Um, and there's, but some of, at least some of the Rafosco, you know, Rafosco, of course, being a, variety from northeastern Italy, but we know some of the Rafosco at least is not Rafosco, it's Mondas, and some of the Mondas <laughs> is not Rafosco at all. And actually, interestingly enough, um, some of the, uh, <clears throat> there used to be more wines in, here in California bottled as Mondas, but we've actually since discovered some of those plantings were neither Rafosco nor Mondas at all, but actually a descendant of Zinfandel. So there's a lot of very mixed, we don't, many of the vineyards, we don't know for sure what we have. The one vineyard that is a definite exception is actually the Lagier Meredith vineyard. Um, Carol did all the testing and made sure all of their cuttings are actual Mondas. And um, this particular wine from Forlorn Hope, they got their cuttings from Lagier Meredith. And this, um, the Rorick Heritage Vineyard where the Forlorn Hope is made, um, it's in the Sierra foothills at around 2,000 feet elevation, and it's also the source for the fruit for Jamie Motley wines. So each of those examples of California Mondas, we do know is actual Mondas. Um, yeah. But some of the others, we would have to do more research to know for sure what, what variety we oh, have. 
although I am convinced that you would have had Mondo's in the 19th century because it even went to Australia if that is the right Mondo's right. And, and and in those days pre phylloxera uh, times there were there was huge plantings of Mondo's in Savoie in neighboring Isère a little bit in Jura in Bouget the whole of that sort of East, there was even some, I believe, in the Northern Rome. So, you know, it was a very, very prevalent grape. So I would say it's highly likely that it would have gone with other cuttings over, over to, the, to California and that it was more in modern times that it was, as you, you explained, mislabeled by, by UC Davis post Second World War. At some point, it was mislabeled as Rafosco. Um, well, and I think we have less Rafosco than we believe. One of, the th one of the things that would be interesting, I don't know that we could figure it out, but actually uh, Tokelon Vineyard is one of the historically most important mm -hmm. sites in California. And if you go back to the old papers for H.W. Crabb who planted the original Tokelon, he had actually created a massive uh, vine library to figure out which varieties he thought grew best in the Napa Valley. And he had identified four that he thought were the future of Napa Valley and Rafosco was one of those. And huh. um, it's the possibility that he was actually a big fan of Mondo's, but we would have to do a little more research and maybe not still not be able to answer the question. But, yeah. but um, I'm curious though, do you have thoughts about, you know, um, Mondo's is, is now, it is slowly growing in interest. There are a few more producers starting to, to make it and a few more. Um, it's going into many of the same vineyards that we've referenced quickly where Trousseau is being established and some Sauvignon or Poulsard are being established. But at the same time, Trousseau is unquestionably the most popular of but, these. Do you have thoughts about, you know, why not Mondo's? Uh, it, it, I think the answer is really simple. It's a bit sad, but it's really simple. It's, it's about what we were discussing at the beginning. It's about the um, extraordinary interest and fashion, for lack of another word, mm. for Jura as opposed to Savoie. And Savoie is very much, um, the region isn't doing this. It's just happening that it's sort of on the co coattails of Jura. And, uh, everybody's sort of waiting for Savoie to happen. And it's, it's a real mountain region. I don't mean it's only a little bit higher in altitude than Jura, but there's more of a mountain mentality. And also they've sold the wines too easily to the ski industry for so many years right, right. that it's been much more recent that they've started to want to export and too many visitors, it, weirdly, there have been more tourists, of course, to Savoie because of the skiing. But wine people have tended to want to keep it to themselves as well. Mm -hmm. They've said, well, and honestly, when they've been skiing, they haven't drunk the best examples. So that's the other problem, that the overall standard in Jura is a little bit higher than the overall standard in Savoie. And yet, the, the great producers of Savoie, of which there are growing numbers and there's a huge influx in, of youngsters coming in, um, produce wines that are right up there with the best of them and arguably easier to love than Jura wines. Mm -hmm. So I believe that, that Mondas and other great varieties from Savoie, and I, I know that Bedrock... Um, Morgan Peterson is, is a big fan of Alpine grape varieties. And I had the privilege to meet him for just like half an hour last year because he was middle of harvest. And he just blew me away with, with telling me that he was planting Persan, which is another, another Savoie red variety. He was planting Etre de la Duy, which is a really, really obscure Isère grape variety that nobody knows about in France. Um, all written about in my book, but it's tiny, tiny, tiny in France. And he's planting those along with Mola, which is another obscure variety from a higher area to the south called Haute-Salpe. And the fact that we have those plantings coming on stream, I think if we're, I, my hope is that in 10 years time, if we do this again, mm -hmm. that actually the Savoie varieties and maybe some white varieties too, like Granger, Altesse and Jacquet 
just might be planted in odd areas in Savoie. Now, the Savoyards and, and some of the neighboring regions like Isère, people like Nicolas Gonin, some of them are not very happy about this, but I'm delighted. They, they want to keep it to themselves. I think it will do Savoy and Isère good and that they will sell more wine if these, wine, these grapes are planted and good wines are made in California and it gets talked about in California. And, and that's what I'd like to see. And by the way, this Mondeuse, it's it's lovely. Well, and this Just is also a, another example of 100% whole cluster um, wine. Um, it notice it has that relatively low alcohol that you were referencing as well. So mm -hmm. we, we do get that kind of lower nat lower alcohol naturally with ripeness and flavor here in California as well on the variety. And one of the things to point out too is that the the cuttings that you mentioned that. Um, Morgan Twain Peterson is establishing in his Sonoma Valley Vineyard Bedrock. Those are actually, he's primarily establishing those from cuttings he's found through old California field blends. And so that's one of the things that's really exciting about getting to talk to you as well and, and kind of getting to know how these varieties show up in California. They actually reference a really old history in California too, that, you know, the the old, old founders of California wine in the second half of the 1800s, they were explorers and experimenters and, and passionately brought in cuttings from all over Europe. And so actually many of these we have, you know, we have in obscure plantings established here in California already. And there's a few, you know, there's a few people that are kind of seeking those out. Morgan has a lot of experience at, like as an amplographer walking vine to vine to vine through the oldest vineyards of California and mapping, mapping the different varieties and any he couldn't identify, he would send off to get tested. And that the kind of work that people like him and the Historic Vineyard Society have done here in California have helped us with the exact phenomenon that you and I are talking about today, these emerging varieties. Well, I, I think that people like him if, if only could, he could find the time to come over at the right time, they would get a lot of support because um, in Savoir in particular, there is an organization called the Centre en Palagraphique, uh, the uh, mm -hmm. Alpine, named after Pierre Gallet, the late um, ampelographer who, who wrote encyclopedias and so on. So this particular organization is rehabilitating a lot of um, almost lost um, Savoir and Isère grapes and, and Alpine grapes and so I mean they were uh, responsible for making sure Mondeuse Blanche didn't get lost they were responsible for making sure Persson didn't get lost and Mondeuse was very well established so that was okay um, but um, there are various other ones coming on stream so what's going on is very exciting um, and also winemaking is the climate is changing in Savoir just as it's changing everywhere mm -hmm. and the winemaking is changing. So whereas um, decades ago, they would have always used whole cluster because there was no other alternative and Mondeuse was not considered good because the stems were not ripe and they were green. The big turning point went, came when they had destemming machines. And that meant that they could get rid of those green, tannic, horrible right. stems. Now it's going the other way around. So now more and more of them are doing whole cluster because they're actually getting ripeness in the stems, partly because of better viticulture, but partly because of, of, of warmer, they're much scarily warmer summers. It's very extreme. Climate change seems to be more extreme in the Alpine areas than it is in some of the even nearby other French areas, especially in the growing season. So there's a lot of changes happening that are, that are, I think, an exchange of information with those in Savoie that are open enough to do that. Um, yes. And some of them are, I, I promise you, <laughs> would, would be fascinating to enable some dialogue. Well, and I love, you know, this, this Mondas, it's like wonderfully aromatic, you know, there's so much ageability here you know, yes. and, and really nice brightness, you know, it's a really lovely, um, it's a really lovely wine. And one of the, one of the things that I think all three of these varieties, but a lot of the other ones that you mentioned from Savoie and Jura as well, they're all actually varieties worth exploring in relation to climate change, because they do, you know, yes. they're, 
they um they do have tend to many of them tend to have naturally lower alcohols um you know and also can't come into ripeness at different parts of the season in a way that serves um, changing climates well too and so i think that you know there's a future for um, exploration that's represented in these wines and um one of the things i want to mention too like jacquer is actually has been planted now in um, Mendocino area of California. I don't recall if Altes has been. I haven't found indication of that. Um, but there's, but there are people looking to these varieties, and I think very much inspired by the work that you've done, um, sharing so much information about these parts of France, but also recognizing that we need solutions for climate change, and and so people in yeah. California are exploring that. One of the quick comments I want to make too is. California has been, or France has been such a world leader in terms of establishing international varieties all over the world. And we've gotten very used to talking about a certain um, family of varieties that really have dominated world planting productions. But actually this, this Eastern part of, of France, you know, uh, Jose has been able to so far identify five founder, founder varieties from France four of them are actually in these areas that that you and I are talking about and in fact if we talk about indigenous varieties um, the greatest concentration of indigenous varieties for France is in this eastern section that that you're um, that you've done so much work on and so there's just a, like a lot of richness to explore and to um, and to find there but so we are out of time though and so as one last question I thought we'd circle back to the um, to the uh, to the chicken problem, there's a lot more food that goes well with wines of Jura and and also wines of the French Alps than chicken. So, what are some of your favorites? Uh, well, in the Jura, it, it's you know obviously it's completely different between Jura varieties and Savoie varieties. But in the Jura, um, the match with anything slightly spicy with with thai with mild indian with all sorts of asian food um savignon in particular the topped up savignons are so versatile but so are some of the oxidative wines you don't have to go as far as vin jaune and then with the with the light reds like the trousseau and the pulsar um they are sort of they go well with with all sorts of vegetarian food as well because they're so light they tend to be chilled you shouldn't have them warm mm -hmm. at all um think think chilling beaujolais um whereas in savoie um the versatility is more is is different the, these are more sort of classic in a way but obviously there's cheese <laughs> and um I, you know i i the matches are endless. Um, Mondo's is arguably a little bit more difficult in Savoie because the tannins can be quite present. I think one of the reasons I particularly love this forlorn hope is that um, it's got a couple of years of age on it. Mm -hmm. And uh, and that's something that people are not doing enough with these varieties and they need to do more. You've got to have age on all of them. But the tannins are rounded and soft. And so uh, the versatility with this is is no question. Or, yeah. You know. yeah, really super, super fun to taste through these and, and talk with you. And I want to remind people too that um, uh, both of Wink's books are available directly um, from her. Um, there's so much to learn. They're both award-winning and um, Wink really is the the world expert on on both of these parts of France. So it's really quite an honor to have you with us. Katie has shared the link for Wink's website. So you can um, you can learn from her writing directly through winetravelmedia.com and also purchase the books directly from, from Wink, which is always a great thing to do for any self-published author. The more um, you can purchase directly from them, the greater the um, kind of return for them. And so Wink, it's it's great to see you. Um, and I thank you so much for making all this time for us. Well, thank you, Elaine. Um, it's just wonderful to see these varieties talked about more. So thanks a lot. Thank you so much. Thanks everybody for being with us today. Thank you, Elaine. Thank you, Wink. Um, and thank you to all of our attendees. Uh, we hope that you'll join us uh, next week, uh, September 22nd at 10 a.m. Elaine will speak with Oz Clark and Richard Siddle in the UK. 
And also just a reminder that the recording for today's webinar will be available on the YouTube channel. And you can also find uh, many other Behind the Wines webinar recordings there. So thank you and have a safe week.